So welcome everyone, good afternoon. Um, and importantly for those of us, uh, those of you linking in uh, via Zoom um, for today's uh, current lecture extended to SOA community and uh, all of our SOA friends uh, in the greater community. Uh, today, we, I have the honor of introducing um, Alex Gorlin, who is um, who is here today for a uh, a workshop and this lecture within the workshop um, with our upper level uh, studio, uh, which we call the Super Studio, uh, because of the work that it's engaging in and and the uh, active participants. Uh, but more importantly, uh, we wanted to open up this uh, lecture uh, to the greater community. And uh, Alex Gordon, Alexander Gordon, uh, uh, is an award-winning uh, design firm, Alex Gordon Architects. Uh, and it's a firm that embraces a, a wide uh, and diverse range of clients um, uh, from, from which they apply, uh, or to which that they apply design excellence. Um, uh, they have offices in New York City and in Miami. Uh, the firm is renowned for its ability to create comfortable, uh, welcoming spaces with a modernistic aesthetic uh, as well. The practice is founded on the belief that excellent design should be applied to all realms of society, uh, something that's very important a very important focus and topic in our in our studio uh, work. To that end, uh, they apply creativity their their creativity and expertise to housing across the social spectrum, as well as to schools, religious institutions, commercial buildings. Uh, they believe in rigorous uh, analysis, uh, as we shall see, uh, synthesis and creativity at every level, uh, and their designs are clean, modern, sophisticated and uh, importantly, fun. Um, uh, in addition to this great uh, design work, um, um, Mr. Golan is a, is a noted architectural critic and scholar. He's the subject of a monograph, Alexander Gordon Buildings and Projects, uh, and is the author of numerous uh, books, uh, Tomorrow's Houses, uh, New England Modernism, uh, and two definitive volumes on the new American uh, townhouses uh, or the new American townhouse, uh, all of which were published by Rizzoli uh, International. Um, uh, many uh, awards, uh, uh, including uh, NA, NIA NYS uh, Excelsior Award, uh, Honor Award for uh, Public Housing, the gener the uh, the Jennings Supportive uh, Housing in 2020, uh, Interior Design, uh, New York City 10 Design Awards, Honoree for Multifamily Residential Award uh, for the Jennings Supportive Housing, uh, Home Builder Digest, uh, the best beach house architect in the US 2020. Uh, and I know I'm embarrassing Alex, uh, but that's okay. Um, Architects Newspaper, uh, top 50 interior architects in 2019 and 2018 as well, um, uh, as well as the Seaside Prize, the Pioneer Architect in Seaside, uh, Dakamomo US uh, Commercial Design Award of Excellence, uh, Dell Works in 2017, um, and the list goes on and on. But without further ado, here to speak to us on really the concept of of dwelling, and Alex calls it a journey to the housing. Um, I present to all of you uh, our good friend, Alex Gordon. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Uh, I uh, was also telling Frank, uh, I spoke at the University of Miami uh, Architecture School many years ago, and the lecture was supposed to start at six o'clock, and literally uh, nobody showed up till seven. So uh, I see things have changed. People are here exactly on time, which I, I'm not used to. So you'll have to excuse me. Um, also, I have not given a talk with a mask on. So uh, if you don't hear me, I guess uh, 
You'll just have to bear with me. <laughs> I think it's working well. Okay. There we go. So uh, this talk is really organized uh, for the housing studio, which is what you're uh, working on this semester. And I uh, wanted to really present my career that deals with uh, how individual private homes uh, and homes for the homeless as well as uh, affordable housing. So like many architects, I started my career uh, doing houses for individual clients. And is this, oh, it's not going forward. What? No, yeah. I'm pressing it. This one. I stuck. Okay. Um, so I was saying, uh, my first projects in the mid 80s were individual homes for private clients. And I, um, I was asked to design these uh, basically uh, houses for wealthy people, which at the time I wasn't really aware of uh, the social impact of that. But um, the house, at, the individual house is really uh, a microcosm all, of all the aspects of architecture, the budget, uh, the siding, uh, you can experiment more with form with it. So at one time it's restricted, but at the same time, uh, it's open to exploration. Um, and it also is a very intense involvement with the client, usually a couple uh, uh, with children, and you get very involved in their psychology. In a way, the, the individual house is like a psychic diagram of the family. And I've had clients who want to be near their children and those who said they want to be as far away as possible from the children and the husband and wife uh, wanted to be uh, as far away from each other. So the house in a, in a sense became a diagram of the interaction within the family. Uh, this was one of the first houses. It was for a, a couple uh, in Jupiter, Florida and uh, the husband is turning 100 this year so I can say that in fact, these houses help extend your lifespan. Um, but uh, it was really, uh, it was supposed to deal with the, uh, the Florida climate, the sun and shadow, and the creation of outdoor rooms that then extend uh, through the house to the exterior on the other side. And I'm just briefly showing you a few slides of all these houses because mainly I'm here to talk about the affordable uh, and homeless housing. And even though it's a fairly modest house, it's not even, it's just about 4,000 square feet, which uh, in terms of private homes is now not a large house. Uh, the proportions were designed to make it look larger. Uh, and it's a narrow pie-shaped site. So it's really front and back. And the idea is like the sides are, uh, like blinders, you don't really, you're not really aware of your neighbors. And this is a house um, in Southampton on the ocean. Uh, and again, one of the uh, one of the things that inspired me was from the beginning was um, I, I went to Cooper Union originally, and there was a book by Le Corbusier called Une Maison, Un Palais, a house and a palace. And it's about Corbusier's small house for his mother on Lake Geneva. Uh, and even though it's a small house for uh, Le Corbusier designed it with an enormous generosity of proportion that opens up to the landscape. So the idea that a small house could have a much bigger scale to it. Uh, and then at the same, in the same book, he presents uh, a palace, the League of Nations public building that was the precursor to the United Nations. And so just the title alone to me was evocative of the idea that a small house could also have the proportions and uh, the sense of generosity as a palace. Uh, so that this became one of the ideas for the affordable housing that everyone deserves a dignified place to live no matter what your economic level is. On the other hand, this, this is really a palace. This is 12,000 square feet. Uh, it's approached uh, up a slight incline 
and facing, it's, it's a, a great frame, uh, one big frame that uh, on the entry side pops out cantilevered uh, teak volumes and also on the right is the garage and the two children's rooms. Uh, it's an upside down house because um, the dunes and the view is on the second level. So you enter below and then on the next, you come in up the stair that goes to the roof terrace. Uh, a uh, stone fireplace divides the dining room from the living room uh, that opens up to the view of the ocean. And this is the ocean view, uh, which is really a great uh, sun porch. It faces south, but the people don't like to be in the sun. They like to be in the shade. Uh, and a teak uh, walkway uh, follows the contours of the dune to the ocean. And the entire top is an outdoor roof deck with volumes that appear sculptural against the sky. And this is the, uh, the uh, porch and the pool. So this is all concerned with, uh, you know, very, this is the 1% problems about where should I put my barbecue? So the barbecue, this barbecue uh, in terms of real estate is worth, I mean, it's phenomenal. It's taking up space that everyone wants to wa be by the ocean side. So rather than put it on the side, you put it over here. Uh, but these kind of issues after a while, uh, I started to get tired of working only for uh, wealthy couples. And in fact, that's the only people who can build individual houses today because most people live in uh, developments that develop uh, or suburban developments that developers designed. Uh, very, very few projects are actually designed by architects. So in school, one gets the impression that you're gonna go out and design everything. But in fact, um, there's a very small percentage of what's built uh, designed by architects. Usually it's by uh, builders, uh, whoever can sign the drawings. So, um, but within the custom house realm, uh, which is also misleading because you see what you see published is really not the tip of the iceberg, that's the whole iceberg. So uh, these are all reasons that I, uh, that led me to do uh, affordable housing. Um, and I developed a kind of Robin Hood practice where the, the fees from these projects help sustain the affordable ones. Uh, this is a house in Nova Scotia. And uh, this client found me on the internet, but almost 20 years ago before it was a common way to find people. Um, and he sent me tickets and we flew to Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he had a helicopter take me around the site because it was inaccessible. And I sighted the house from the helicopter. So it's this great uh, exposed granite bedrock of boulders uh, on the Atlantic. And I divided into smaller uh, pavilions because uh, each one faces a different direction and view. So this one faces a historic lighthouse. Uh, this, the Atlantic shipping lanes that uh, years ago, actually the Titanic uh, floated by. Uh, and this to a World War II uh, uh, bunker actually on an adjoining site. And it's also divided into, small, into these pavilions because another irony of the site is that uh, if it was all one house, and you in fact see many uh, kind of suburban type homes uh, not too far, they really destroy the scale of the site. So the idea was to limit the size of each room uh, and have its own pavilion, which would create their own identity and also uh, not overwhelm uh, the scale of the boulders on the site. So it's very dramatic, uh, all uh, cast concrete and steel windows, uh, zinc roof. Um, it's, uh, it's also meant to be bold to not only frame the view from the interior, but also to, uh, to look like it grew out of the site. And from the inside, there are multiple perspectives. Uh, each room has a different direction. So together it creates this kind of array of perspective that creates a dynamic um, view of, uh, of the exterior. And then this is uh, from these houses, uh, I was asked um, by actually the developer of Seaside. Are you familiar with Seaside here? Oh, okay. Uh, Robert Davis to come up 
and do one of the um, one of the commercial buildings, the retail buildings on the main square. And this uh, this became a very long and to this day it's almost 25 years relationship uh, with uh, Andreas Duani and Elizabeth Plater Zyber, uh, interacting with their urban plans, doing buildings in them, being on charrettes everywhere from Jersey City to Abu Dhabi. Uh, we were in Abu Dhabi on a um, charrette where they had a camel fair uh, in the convention center below. And I designed uh, five townhouses on Ruskin Square which is uh, one of the urban plazas on axis with the main square, including my own house, um, which I uh, fortunately bought a lot. Uh, and then at a, it was fairly, very inexpensive at the time. And then in the year that I was supposed to build the lot, uh, to build the house, you gave, they gave you a year deadline. Uh, Prince Charles published a book about seaside and new urbanism. And I felt that if Prince Charles was doing the marketing for this town, uh, it would probably be a good bet to, to invest in it. And so it doubled in value and I took a loan against the value of the lot. And basically I built this house, uh, not this one, but the next one I'll show you, uh, without spending more than a few hundred dollars per year, per month. But this was for a, a client, um, actually two clients from Tennessee who love New Orleans. And um, the idea was to base it on the idea of a New Orleans house that was all shutters and French doors. So the entire house is based upon the module of the uh, French door and shutter uh, to create, a, to completely cover the facade and also allow from the side, different uh, moods, whether the shutters are open or closed. So on the, uh, all the houses on, at Seaside are on the rental program, and this was called uh, uh, the Shutter House. And inside it's very New Orleans uh, with fans and shutters, and it, it screens the light very beautifully. Then this is the opposite side of Ruskin Place. Um, and one of the issues at Seaside is that each uh, owner could, was encouraged to hire their own architect. So the idea of uh, creating more uh, variety uh, in the town also became a kind of cacophony of styles and, um, and uh, it, there was a kind of lack of unity that I think even Robert felt that, Robert Davis, the developer, felt if he did it again, he would uh, create blocks of, of, of design rather than have individual people do it. But the corner, this is the house I, des I designed for myself as a kind of developer, a speculative house, uh, especially uh, there were two hurricanes the year I owned it and I felt this was, I should really uh, not wait until all the glass was shattered by, <laughs> but actually it survived completely for 25 years, even the last hurricane uh, it was untouched. Um, and I, having had a modernist background, I decided to make my own house different from the others. And at first I thought, you know, the people who lived at Seaside would be, uh, resent something that was not in the traditional style. But in fact, uh, even though Seaside was presented as a kind of uh, the way people lived in the old days. In fact, nobody had houses like this in the old days. And so uh, this was as exotic as the traditional uh, uh, kind of vernacular design that, that people uh, live, um, came to Seaside for. And the idea was to still keep the same, to the same guidelines of, of vertically oriented windows, a balcony, uh, a stoop, so it was a kind of abstraction of a traditional townhouse, almost a New York townhouse where you could meet people on the stoop. It's very publicly oriented. Uh, it's really a stage that you can see and be seen from inside and looking out, and then culminating in this stairway, a uh, spiral stair that was a kind of widow's walk to view the ocean, uh, the Gulf of Mexico from the roof. Um, and it was fun to put this together. Uh, 
and um, actually some, an architect bought it recently and said he wanted to restore it to the, its original decor. So it's interesting to be considered a landmark uh, in your own time. Um, and this was myself at the top of the spiral stair uh, looking for whales uh, you know, in the Gulf. And it was also featured in the uh, Truman Show, which was a film uh, about living in a bubble. Um, and it was, um, uh, Jim Carrey was the star of that show, but they used my house as the architect's house uh, in the film. So from Seaside, uh, I comes Aqua, which is in Miami Beach, and I hope sometime early in March to be able to take you there. This was also designed by Duane Kleider Zyber, DPZ. Has anyone been there here? You've been there, okay. Uh, so this was their first urban uh, design, the first urban new urbanist design. So rather than a planned community in suburbia, this was in a city and it outlines um, Andres's idea of the transect, which is a section from the rural, which is off to the left, left is the Everglades. Uh, but the one story houses two townhouses, then these uh, mid-rise towers to the towers of Collins Avenue. So it was an idea of uh, a kind of continuum of scale uh, rather than again, doing the traditional towers or slabs along the beach. And also, actually, uh, Elizabeth uh, designed it, not Andres. And she also reversed uh, the usual uh, urban planning so that all the entire exterior is public space. So you can walk around the outside by the water, whereas the tradition in Miami, unfortunately, is private, uh, private zones that face the most desirable area, which is that on the water. So, you, you know, they're barely finishing the boardwalk along the ocean. Uh, along Colin. Uh, so it's been a long time to, to instill the idea of public space, which she did also in uh, the design district as well. And I was fortunate enough to uh, be asked by Liz to design this building, the southernmost uh, tower. And the developer uh, actually decided to name each of the buildings after the architects. So this, this is after Walter Chatham, Allison Spear, who's Lorinda Spear of Architect Hanukkah's sister. And this is my building, uh, the Gorla. So uh, I love, so I bought an apartment here also, and I love being this is the proverbial big fish in a small pond. <laughs> um, but again, the idea was to create a kind of urban space of streets, um, creating public space um, with the townhouses and the mid-rise towers. Uh, and pedestrian areas that you can uh, walk all around. And the idea was to instill a sense of community um, by creating a community that is not, um, it's like individual homes on individual lots. And this is my, uh, the tower I designed facing south. So there are sunscreens to break the sun. Um, and the idea is there, it's like a quadrant with four only three apartments on each floor. And these are the penthouses up here. And the Brie Soleil, the Sunbreakers, and the column, um, the eponymous name. And then from Seaside, uh, that's where I really decided rather than uh, to do individual homes, uh, I made an appointment with the head of a housing preservation department in New York City. Uh, actually, because I couldn't make the new urbanist uh, interview with him. Uh, and it took a year to get a meeting with him. And I said, I want to do affordable housing. I just, I want to be able to do something at a larger scale. And he actually said, well, we don't, the city doesn't actually build anything. It's all done by individual developers. So he gave me the name of uh, the company, the Nehemiah Developer Company. And Nehemiah is a nonprofit housing uh, developer, and it was named after the prophet who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. And it's sponsored by local churches of the community, and it's organized by 
the community organizing group called the Metro IAF, the Metropolitan Industrial Areas Foundation. Uh, this was founded by Saul Alinsky, who was the kind of uh, the first uh, major community organizer in this country. And my client, Mike Geekin, was actually uh, uh, one of Obama's teacher, teachers in terms of community organizing. And in fact, Obama took his course and was affiliated, and that's where he learned community organizing, but he didn't talk about it because uh, Alinsky was a socialist. And so at the time, uh, that was, he didn't want to associate with uh, the idea of, you know, of community organizing too closely in a way. But um, I met him actually at an early fundraising party, and he, uh, he, did, he reacted very uh, positively to, to this organization. And this was the, uh, these are the Nehemiah houses that I, I uh, saw when, these were the ones that had been built before I got involved with the organization. And they were all identical, but they had built 2000 of them. The idea is that they're all um, uh, for first time home buyers and people, but they're sold at cost. So the nonprofit developer builds them and sells them uh, or could rent them, but in this case, they're for sale uh, at cost. And the city actually donated the land uh, and helped with the foundation. So it's really a public-private partnership uh, in terms of how these houses are built. On the other hand, um, my first reaction was that they weren't very urban. Uh, as you can see, there's front yard parking. Uh, there is it's gated. Uh, people then, uh, you know, personalize the houses with uh, gates with lions and you know tigers or whatever uh, you know to, uh, so i suggested that uh they actually hired me because they wanted to do they were tired of the same design and they wanted something new so i suggested that they brought be brought forward so they would be more urban they would define the street wall uh they would also have um, steps and like outdoor stoops uh, so that people could interact, like in Jane Jacobs' book, um, Life and Death of American Cities, uh, and create a, more of a sense of community rather than each individual home homeowner uh, gating off their homes like it was, uh, you know, some suburban development. Uh, so it was the site was a, a landfill uh, off Jamaica Bay in New York City near Kennedy Airport. And this portion became a park. This is the Belf Parkway. And this was the site of the Nehemiah Homes. This part is a shopping center that was uh, just built by related companies who also does a lot of work here. And this was the original urban plan. And we did the entire uh, Eastern part over here. And then related, the shopping center became so uh, popular that they offered to pay for all the uh, infrastructure because this was really entirely landfill um, and there was no uh, sewage lines, no electrical, there was nothing on this site. So everything had to be put in from the beginning. So this was also a great infrastructure project, but the problem was by related, double the size of the shopping center in exchange for paying for the infrastructure and so the site became much more elongated rather than centralized with a park in the center. So the park got moved over here. And uh, we did the, uh, we helped with this site plan. And uh, unfortunately, uh, the blocks are extremely long, which uh, become a bit overwhelming. And I, there was no way to divide up the blocks uh, because when I would, I told the client and they said every house was important. They didn't want to lose one house. So the social aspect of providing housing uh, was, uh, was wonderful, but it, it uh, to some degree uh, compromised the uh, intimacy of the plan that it, it could have been. But nevertheless, uh, we had, and it was very strange. New York City is not, I would say not well organized to, give, to start off. <laughs> We, have, we, as the architects who had never done this, were in charge of meetings. There were 30 people in a room 
talking about where to put the gas lines and uh, where to put the electrical boxes. And uh, because the client wasn't paying for this, but it was done through the developer, um, I would say, well, I, I, each electrical box should relate to each house. It should go under the stairs. And so they said, well, we can't do that. We, you know, why would we do that? They were just gonna put them in all over the place. So that every little thing became a fight. So it was actually a great lesson in urban planning, you know, by one seat of the pants, because this, and then I was wondering who, who's in charge of all this? So unfortunately that's the way cities are often built. If, uh, if the client is not, especially with affordable housing, but luckily we got what we wanted. Um, now all the houses before, even previously were prefabricated. And Nehemiah had actually set up these factories in the Brooklyn Navy Yard to build this prefabricated housing. So they set up these factories. Of course, uh, the last, the present mayor in all his wisdom closed these factories, uh, you know, even though they could have been going on at the end of the Nehemiah program. But they're all built individually as these boxes with, con with steel frame and concrete floors. Uh, and they're built like tanks, really. Um, and so it's a really inspiring thing to see. This is a uh, space that during World War II, they uh, built anchors. And then they're brought on trucks to the site. And I was, uh, I guess the word is interrogating every aspect uh, because the original Nehemiah that I showed you previously were only 18 feet, no, 17 feet wide which is not really wide enough to have two uh, nice sized bedrooms in the back if you divide that dimension in two. So I uh, inquired and it turned out that because the units uh, were trucked on the streets of New York in the, in, from, in, from Brooklyn, basically to Brooklyn, uh, it could be as wide as 20 feet because it did not have to go over bridges and tunnels or through tunnels. So often the limitations on uh, prefab is limited to bringing the boxes uh, actually to the site. Of course, you can also cut them in half or slice in the center, uh, but it just creates more seams that can leak. Uh, then they're, uh, they're put together like Lego. Uh, it's, they did this very quickly. Uh, and again, ideally it should take, it should take far less time but then the city inspectors come, uh, which bogged down the time. So in the end, it took a bit less and it was less expensive, but it, uh, due to bureaucracy and regulations that uh, were not streamlined for the project, it uh, created uh, certain uh, delays in the, in the time. And each box is 20 by 40 feet uh, and the end of the, the two story ones are a single family, but then the three and four are two family, or you could uh, have your grandparents live in it. So you come, up, you come in and this is one unit of two bedrooms. And then the stair goes up to the second and third floor, which is a three bedroom unit, but only the owner has access to the backyard through the stair on the second floor. And I, this is the beginning where I, I found that uh, because the budgets were very low, uh, in fact, they said that they didn't, you know, each plumbing turn from the street was $75. And, you know, when you're talking about things at that uh, limited uh, uh, price point, as opposed to these houses where, you know, 100,000 didn't mean anything, uh, color became something that I used to create variety uh, an identity to the project. And I argued because it was really sponsored by the church, uh, they were the, uh, the developers, uh, that the first Nehemiah was the prophet who rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. But because this is all new construction, this should have uh, the colors of the, found, the 12 foundation stones of the new Jerusalem. So I used, uh, you know, in this case, a religious, uh, uh, argument uh, to get them to use, to actually we, in the end we had 10 colors uh, and uh, it gave, I'll show, created a lot of uh, 
variety that otherwise the, the developer didn't want to do. And it was also inspired by the work of Bruno Taut uh, in Germany. He was one of the early pioneers of affordable housing. Um, and he used a lot of color, not only in the facade, but even in the mullions. You see how it's yellow and red uh, to give variety to uh, the facade. And so this was the, um, the two-story unit. And they're all raised uh, almost four feet off the ground because uh, the entire site is capped with a plastic uh, sheet because there's the potential for methane in the, uh, because it was landfill, there were pockets where there could be methane gas that would have to be uh, mitigated and brought uh, out through the roof. In the end, there was no methane gas, which is fine, which is great, but it's still, that's why everything was elevated to this degree. Um, and I also, we added uh, bay windows, which also became a big fight with the developer who just, you know, anything other than the most basic flat roof, all the same color, that's all they wanted to do. But by the end, they actually threw in the bay windows for no price at all. So these are, uh, Three-story units, uh, we had a, a number of different designs as, as the colors uh, to give variety. Uh, and this is now as it's developed, and it's really very, uh, uh, very wonderful how there are no, here, now even though they're straight to the street, there are no gates, nobody puts up fences. Uh, it's the idea of Jane Jacobs eyes on the street, people are watching each other, they're proud of their homes. Uh, even when a lot, while I was walking around, they said, who are you? What are you doing here? So um, I said, I'm the architect, which was a great risk, uh, but fortunately many of them liked them. I don't mind a few little personal touches, more of the lions have come back, but it's, uh, it's wonderful to see, uh, you know, it's near Kennedy Airport, the plane. So it's really grown in and it's really become a, a community. And it's, uh, this is a drone shot showing the relationship to Jamaica Bay. Um, and it's become actually a very desirable place to live. And you can't sell your house for a few years, so you can't flip, flip the uh, design. And I also learned that uh, I started off with colors that are more tentative, but as it developed, I became bolder because I saw at a, a large scale, at the scale of, uh, these blocks that are a few hundred feet long, the colors became washed out. So uh, I started making more bolder plan, uh, color selections and contrasts. And the parking is in the rear here. So there's no front yard parking, which is a tradition actually in, in uh, Queens and Brooklyn. <clears throat> and from the Nehemiah, um, the same community organizing group recommend, recommended me to Common Ground, which does housing for formerly homeless people. And it was set up by Roseanne Haggerty, who developed three hotels in Times Square into homeless housing. This is not, these are not shelters. These are not temporary. These, this is called supportive housing. Supportive housing has um, actual apartments. They're usually studio apartments, but they can be one bedroom as well. And the size is dictated by the Housing Preservation Department. They're about 350 square feet each. And on the ground floor and in the building are social services. So there are job placement agencies, social workers, uh, psychologists, uh, some doctors. And I use the analogy, it's the same series of, of people as uh, you find at a high-end building on Park Avenue like 740 Park, where people have plastic surgeons downstairs and psychiatrists. So it's really enabling uh, people who are less uh, at a different economic level to have the same amenities as the wealthy do. So this, um, this was the first of the supportive housing that I designed. And the idea was um, to have the corner uh, have a kind of heart of, of red that would become a landmark uh, and the sense of where the community comes together, which is the theme of common ground. So, um, 
and people, it doesn't look like homeless housing. It looks like, like a, you know, higher end apartment house. And there are outdoor terraces. Uh, the panels are uh, steel with baked on paint. And in the back, there's a garden. And this is the second one I did for Common Ground where, uh, although in the middle of this, they changed their name to Breaking Ground. And uh, this is 150 units. And it also not only includes homeless, but uh, HIV positive and some senior units as well. These are also all studio apartments. And here, uh, the idea of the color uh, really takes the idea of the first, but intersperses it on the facade. And the selection, uh, I chose to do historic colors to kind of give the idea of memory to the site. So this is in the South Bronx, and it was the site of Jane Morris's uh, farm. He was one of the signers of the Declaration of Independence. Uh, and he actually offered his farm in the Bronx to become the capital of the United States. However, that was a real estate deal that didn't quite work out. So uh, it's um, so now the uh, this has also the support of uh, social services on the ground floor. Uh, there's a roof terrace. There's a green roof. It's all um, this was uh, I think um, Leeds silver, and the idea of the color as well as the historic colors, which were colors of that period also relates to the artist Gerhard Richter, who did these color studies in a strict grid. Um, so the idea of using color at a symbolic level uh, to animate facades at a not expensive level is something that's common to all of these um, housing developments. And this is the lower level plan, the entrance. Uh, these are the offices with social services. And then these are common rooms on this side, and then a, a large multi-purpose uh, room that could be brought together. Uh, each of the individual apartments has lots of windows, and the hallways have windows at the end, so they're cheerful. Uh, there's light that comes in at every point. And this actually was on budget for the housing, uh, this nonprofit developer. And this is the lobby with uh, and the idea of there was actually a, a rock outcropping on the site and the, the ceiling was to mirror <clears throat> a bit of that geology. And this is one of the units. Uh, they're very nicely, uh, this is all vinyl floor to look like wood, um, but they're cheerful and, and light filled. And then this is uh, the site of um, another project in the Bronx. This is uh, the South Bronx. This is actually a photograph I took in 1980 uh, for a studio um, at Yale that Robert Stern taught uh, called South Bronx Suburbia. And he wanted to turn these abandoned buildings at the time into a, the idea was to explore the idea of a suburban development in the South Bronx. And this is the site where uh, Jimmy Carter came to view what was going on. And this is uh, Charlotte Street. And what our project is actually at the end of Charlotte Street, right here. Oh, here's Charlotte Street. So this is for a, a nonprofit called New Destiny. And it helps uh, women who are survivors of domestic violence uh, to give apartments uh, for them. And it also includes social services. So this is as well as uh, help homeless as well. So the idea was to divide up the volume to create more of a tower that would uh, be at the end of Charlotte Street. Unfortunately, they in fact did build suburban houses on lots on Charlotte Street rather than rebuild the city uh, with an urban street wall like the traditional city. So this is of such a low density that uh, it's really not a very good use of, of the site. Um, but we were trying to continue the street wall here and also create an object. And the entrance, which has an open loggia, um, a, a, a corridor that is open to the view here, there's a children's play yard here and another garden in the front. And this is the, we just finished this uh, this past June 
And I used, uh, this time we had perforated panels uh, that cover the air conditioning units. And the, uh, again, you can see how it's divided, the massing is divided into two parts. Uh, one is more of a tower and one is more of a background building. And here I used colors from an Andy Warhol um, flower series. Um, I don't want to say I wanted to make them more feminine, but I did. But the client said that's okay. They wanted that. <laughs> um, and this is the facade where we rotated the brick to create more uh, pattern and actually to create the sense of uh, almost like an armored facade. So in a way it implies that the women who are very vulnerable would feel uh, protected just very gently by the architecture. Uh, again, the architecture has this kind of symbolic uh, meaning to it. And this is the entrance, which somehow we managed to make it look like a, not like, you know, homeless and uh, supportive housing, but to make it much more cheerful uh, with light and animated goings on in the architecture. And this is one of the units uh, we actually, we somehow managed to get so much light in these units that they look, they're actually quite wonderful apartments with floor to ceiling glass. This is one of the bedrooms, but this is also for families. So most of the, uh, the people have children here. So they're more really apartments. And this is the last one. This is under construction. This is communal life. Um, and this is, um, this is also in the South Bronx. This is, an, uh, for a, this is for a nonprofit that has homeless and also a program called Life is Precious that uh, is designed to, pre to prevent Latina suicides, which apparently is a big problem. Um, and the asymmetry actually mirrors abstractly their logo of a heart. And I was looking at a Paul Clay painting to kind of come up with that. And uh, the client also wanted to have a kind of Latin theme. So this is, a, this is actually the sidewalk from the Copacabana in Rio de Janeiro. Uh, so the idea of colored panels and, and elements that refer to precedents um, that relate to the uh, history and community uh, of the neighborhood. And this is the entrance. We're having a competition to do murals on the side, uh, I was inspired by the Mexican mural show at the Whitney Museum that recently uh, was being exhibited at the uh, political murals by Diego, Diego Rivera and Siqueiros. And so uh, we're gonna have a competition to, for young artists. Actually, the, the plan also includes a, a full art gallery on the ground floor to help uh, artists in the South Bronx. And again, the the colors are uh, inspired by flags from Latin America. Um, it, this is it under construction. And then, oh, this is the last. This is a housing project in Brownsville <clears throat> in Brooklyn. And this is um, the last ungentrified area in New York City. And these are perfect examples of the kind of uh, uh, Le Corbusier's idea of the tower in the park, but not uh, executed in any way uh, with the proper size windows and they're not attended properly. So they've become very grim, unpleasant spaces to live. So again, Common Ground asked me to uh, come up with some idea on how to uh, re-urbanize this. And this is, actually closest to what they're doing because this is the, uh, these are three housing developments. Uh, and as you can see, they, this was done in the 1950s where they created super blocks. So even though the texture of the neighborhood is divided into these 200 foot uh, wide blocks like the rest of New York City, the idea was to create these giant super blocks that combine everything uh, here going against the grain of the neighborhood uh, with no shops whatsoever. It's like a desert of, uh, of retail, 
people wander around here. There are very few uh, uh, playing fields, anything. Uh, and then on this side, again, you can see the original streets that were blocked off into these super blocks. So I proposed to kind of uh, reattach it, re-urbanize this <clears throat> by bringing the streets through where we could and where here we could do one in the middle and then to uh, look at the ground plane in more detail and to bring uh, basketball courts, uh, even you know, gardens, farm fields, um, and retail along the exterior, the periphery. And the idea, which was very important, not to displace one person. So, you know, it would be very easy to say, well, you could build in between and then tear everything down. But usually, well, that happens in Chicago. And in fact, uh, like Cabrini Green was torn down, you know, with the promise of bringing people back to homes. And in fact, the people were dispersed all over the city. So the idea here is not to displace anyone, but to keep the existing buildings and find uh, lots in between that you could infill and make a more urban setting. And then also we looked at, uh, this is what's there now. We looked at also adding uh, uh, lightweight construction to add units on top of these buildings. So the purple are new, uh, new housing, um, the blue is schools, and the little, these white boxes are new housing on top of existing buildings, which would be uh, structurally possible. And then this is existing, and this is with a, a greenhouse and farm field in the center, another basketball court, uh, kind of reorganizing this more closely related to the uh, the geometry of the buildings. And this is greening the entire uh, development with uh, also a roof, uh, gardens on the roofs, greenhouses, solar, sun. This was showing everything possible. And actually now the New York City Housing Authority is finally, after many years, uh, really developing some of the empty sites and, and, and thinking about this more seriously. These are greenhouses that we went to Toronto actually to see examples and in Toronto they have done things like this and retail along the street um, again defining the street rather than having this amorphous uh, space that has no meaning to it. So so that's that. Any questions or anything? Or? <laughs> so it seems like a lot of these examples are working for nonprofit developers. Is that kind of typically the case with a lot of these social housing? Yes. Yes. Actually, uh, affordable housing in New York City are divided into nonprofit developers that are mainly social uh, uh, supportive housing and then for-profit affordable housing. And they don't have the social services and uh, they, it, in fact, there are two conventions every year, each of which have 2000 people. And one is the, um, it's called NYSAFA, New York State Affordable Housing and SHINI, which is State Supportive Housing, Supportive Housing Development uh, of New York. So it's actually equally divided. But the nonprofits um, do more of the social services. Cost wise, would you say they're similar? Yes. Mm -hmm. In New York, affordable housing is $400 a square foot. So <laughs> in Miami, it's different, but they don't seem to build very much of it. So. Alex, can you show us examples of? Did you have to deal with or what about accessibility 
Uh, at the time we built it, we didn't. And actually in New York, even now, uh, an individual house or townhouse does not have to be uh, handicapped accessible. I mean, which one could design it to be accessible, but in this case it was, actually we couldn't be on grade because of the landfill and the methane. So it had to be raised with this um, crawl space underneath each house. But I would say, uh, you know, going forward and now, especially we would make provision, even if it's not required. And then, um, so you're saying it's doable, yeah. but then also the importance of door yards in general. What, the importance of having those little door yards in general. There were, there were places for, you had the students, we had, they were, Oh, oh, the little uh, yards on the side. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, every square foot is is valuable. And uh, I mean, people really planted entire gardens in these, like, um, basically, like, eight by 12 foot side yards. I mean, they also have the backyard as well. Right. Except, unfortunately, they can't plant trees because that would puncture the plastic uh, sealer. A uh, question: are, are the people in the last project involved in any way in the decisions before to do the, the I mean, to open the streets and things like that? Are, are the community involved in all the, you know, the decisions to do to do that? Uh, no, actually, what I did was uh, backwards. <laughs> except it was, I was requested to do it. There was no charrette, there was, it was thrown out there to get a response from the community. So I used all my uh, new urbanist kind of knowledge to create spaces that were, uh, I felt would be uh, interesting to people, but, uh, and make it more urban, but, then it went, it's been actually going through community involvement presentations the last few years. Thank you. But so yes, you could do a charrette in both ways. You could do a charrette two ways. <laughs> so Alice, also the, uh, the I mean, I, I love the fact that you're emphatic about it's supportive housing, et cetera, that doesn't, um, you know, by no means is it looking like uh, what we think of as affordable housing. And that's super, super important, but also um, the way that you treated colors, that like you referred to them as they can be historic and symbolic. Um, how, how a little bit of that how well i would say uh, in certain instances like in boston road they were uh historic because i was giving it another layer of meaning by referring to uh colors that were used you know during the period of uh the american revolution so during the period in which uh the the area in which it uh situated morrisania uh, colors that would have been apparent at the time. Uh, the ones used for New Destiny are not historic, they're symbolic uh, in terms of, well also actually the Boston Road colors were uh, very intentionally muted and, in, and made not, I didn't want them to be cheerful like when they want, I wanted them to have a certain dignity and intensity and gravity that was um, not the usual kind of primary colors that you would see. So there were primary, but they were shifted. I mean, the, the, my use of color is really developing in each project. So. Now the colors for the Nehemiah housing were limited to uh, party plank. <laughs> so there, I, you know, initially I said, I want to do all custom colors, but they, there wasn't enough um, 
there wasn't enough demand and there wasn't enough square footage that was called for that would allow for custom colors. And also uh, I just accepted their budget. So I took, I just went through the, all of the existing Hardy Plank, which is a cementitious board colors and found combinations that would be effective. I mean, this is not unlike uh, Edwin Lutyens did housing in London in which he did very graphic colors on the facades. And I think Venturi has used color in that similar aspect. Is that that? Oh. <laughs> yeah. And um, I, I like the, I mean, one thing that I found interesting is that in many of the projects, you first and foremost took a, it's almost as if you came up with an urban partie that the architecture then would really be very much supported of, but at the same time, it would yield you. Mm -hmm. No, the urban the urban aspect is essential from the beginning. I mean, in New York, it's also you have to be very well, like anywhere, but especially it's extremely restricted in terms of zoning setbacks. Um, if you make this move, you can't do that move. So uh, the zoning is something. I mean, in the real project, you have to check all these things first. You have to check codes, zoning, setbacks, um, and those really, I mean, in a way, they're an equivalent to the new urbanist guidelines. I see Liz here. <laughs> um, so I tell you, the new urbanist guidelines are a kind of uh, another level of, well, it is a code, uh, and it has to be layered in connection to uh, the city. Well, I, I guess, Liz, you, when you make a development, you create your own code within the realm of the city. It depends if the city code's good enough. Um, <laughs> right. You might not need to, it may already be a good urban code. But um, Alex, I wonder, um, can you look forward a little? What are you anticipating is happening now or in the near future in this world of affordable housing? You know, I'm conscious that you, the New York scene is always more advanced um, than most of the rest of the country. Uh, you know, those supportive housing um, projects that you described and the, the non-for-profit that produces them and so on. But um, what do you see happening? You know, like what, would, what should the students be thinking about in the near, for the near future? Well, I would say it's a, it's a very important program that needs to be studied and uh, really advanced. I mean, the idea of marrying social services to housing as an integral relationship between the two. Um, and I think, uh, I mean, going forward from when you graduate, I mean, it's definitely something I would consider, you know, you, there are careers in working for these nonprofits as architects. And I think that's one thing that has not been, uh, that's, that's one area that not enough architects have really explored as a one career path. Mm -hmm. Rather than work for a, another architect and design things, you can also well, either work for a nonprofit uh, or you can even work for city government to help change the rules that would allow more of this to be built. So I think uh, I'm always, I mean, maybe I don't know, but Miami seems to a lack and doesn't seem to have enough affordable and social housing, uh, I mean, supportive housing compared to New York, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Any, any last questions from the group? Oh, yeah, still the last one. Okay. Uh, in regards to um, location for all these social housing projects, um, I guess, uh, where, like, would you say they're all located near, like, public transportation area? Um, are they located more towards, uh, kind of suburbs area, towards, like, the extent of the city? Uh, they're, they're located in, uh, I mean, at, the ones I've worked on are mostly in the Bronx and in Brooklyn. 
Um, but they're, I think by law, they're going to expand to New York, uh, to Manhattan. They're usually near transportation. Um, it's also limited by the sites that are available because originally, like 20 years ago, there were so many empty lots in New York that they were like giving them away. Uh, but now it's actually very hard to find buildable lots. And so there is a partnership now with churches that need, uh, that are having financial problems to do something in conjunction with the church. And we were working on one uh, also in the Bronx where uh, we designed the church and the housing for the site. Uh, and in exchange for the, uh, the site, the church would be given a new, uh, new project. So. so here in South Florida, there's been discussion with the school board about using the open land, because of course, some of the suburban school sites are quite large. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's always shocking in Manhattan you realize uh, children were never that important because the school lots are like, <laughs> they're, they're embarrassingly small. So when, then, then when you go outside in Florida, they're like campuses, right? Yes. Um, is some of the affordable um, housing that you have done, how do you address um, parking? Um, ah. I don't know, I, I mean, <laughs> here, we're definitely dealing with uh, Parking, yes. Not well, uh, New York is an unusual situation, and uh, in fact, in all of these sites, there's uh, there are parking requirements, but because they are near transportation hubs, uh, they've been waived. So, in fact, none of these have uh, parking required, which has been fortunate because the, uh, it would be well, it would increase the cost significantly if it was structured parking. Uh, there could have been some accommodated on the site, but it would have taken away uh, open space on the ground level. But that's unique to New York, I would say. Even the, uh, even the one from Jamaica. Oh, oh uh, well, actually, the Nehemiah housing, but that, that's affordable. That's, that's not the support, that's not the bigger. Those do have two, uh, two parking spaces required. And those are in the back, uh, through the back alley. And that, that was a very beautiful plan because I saw that, I mean, there was a nice, there was a, a great understanding of front and back relationships, the idea of having the alleyways and allowing for right. some amount of parking. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and actually they're parking strips, they're not, uh, so it doesn't, it's not, you're not paving the whole backyard. They're just strips to allow the tires to sit on. Wonderful. All right, okay, thank great. you. So, now I look forward to your presentation. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna carry this back <laughs> to the studio and those joining us thank on you. Zoom, thank you very much. <laughs> and thank you, Alex, right. for sharing with the larger community.